before I understand. When somebody has a trauma, it is often compartmentalized in a portion of their brain. It is walled off, but it peaks out, leaks out on occasion. And sometimes it requires a person to be ready to take a deep dive and get into therapy. But sometimes it can be as easy as a person unloading a secret that they've held that causes them fear, shame, guilt. And that sharing in a, with a person that can keep it confidential, it can't just be Joe Schmo on the road, can be life changing yeah. for that person's trauma. Yeah. So I want to go to say that I encourage people to find somebody, a friend or whatever, a trusted adult that you can maybe identify in your mind because it is possible to, in just sharing with a non-professional, something that has happened to you that can start and spur you towards a journey of healing. So um, that was the flaw. Yeah. So to go along with that, we know that um, people that have experienced a trauma where they either witnessed death or they were in fear of their own death, if, if they can, within about 36 to 48 hours, if they can retell their story, um, and there's a process of grounding as they walk through the story of, of what happened. They're much less likely to compartmentalize. They're much less likely to go on and develop this classic uh, signs and symptoms of PTSD. So it's not just telling the story after years of, you yes. know, kind of neurotic type of protection, but even to do it early after the trauma can really help, you know, make sense of what they experienced and avoid the PTSD response. Yes. And thank you for saying that. I, I, I don't mean to say that people should hold it on and oh, then tell your doctor yeah. years later, 30 or 20. Sure. Ideally people have an opportunity to, to acutely get some crisis intervention. And to well, you know, you get a lot of, you get a lot of people that, that experience these um, life threatening uh conditions and experiences, they will want to talk about it, right? They're, they're kind of being driven to discuss it. And it's their loved ones that say, oh, but you're okay now, you're safe. Don't talk about it. You're okay. Just relax. You just, you just need to heal. And, you know, I try to meet with those parents or those people the caregivers and explain, you know, let the patient be the guide. If, if the patient is trying to tell you the story and if they're trying to tell you the story for the 15th time, go with it. Don't guide them. Don't give them insight, but just keep reminding them you're safe. You know, thank you for sharing, but let them work through it because they're making some sense of it, you know, in their mind. Um, my daughter and one of her really great friends had a, terrible car wreck um the snow blizzard hit unexpectedly the the interstate was absolutely filled with cars and trucks and it was dark and so they were trying to get back to the college you know they changed their mind where they were going and trying to go back home ultimately um an 18 wheeler hit the back end of the car which sent them first spinning and then flipping and when they finally, when the car finally came to a, a, a standstill, it had hit, it was in West Virginia. And so it had hit a rock face and kind of fell down, like kind mm -hmm. of on its side, but a little upside down. And so there were some nurses that were actually in the following behind them on the way to the hospital when it all happened. So they saw, the nurses saw it as it happened and they, you know, pulled over to provide aid. And I talked with a couple of them in the emergency room, you know, later on. And they said that it was so interesting because the uh, my daughter's friend was frozen, catatonic, like just couldn't couldn't answer a question, couldn't do anything. They wrapped her in a blanket, sat her down in their car and she just didn't move, you know, for two hours. She's just there waiting for them to get the ambulance because the snow and everything. My daughter had a dramatically different 
um, immediate acute reaction that she has no memory of. Like there's no, even today, there's no memory. And that is that she began, the nurses said that she began running around and picking things up that had come out of the car, book, books and shoes and, you know, things like that, began picking things up and running over and putting it back in the car. And they, they kept saying, you know, you need to come and sit, you need to come rest. And she said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Let me get this. Let me get this. Let me clean this up. So it, it just shows you the brain does very strange things when you um, are in these types of life-threatening situations and there's not any reaction that's wrong or bad. It's just your instinctive reaction. And for her, it was to regain control as quickly. Even when it was happening outside of her awareness, she had this drive to put things in order. Um, mm -hmm. But her friend was really protecting and had really gotten internally focused and but neither neither of them really remember anything you know being there at the scene if, if, if the nurses hadn't have been there we never would have known you know how they react well i want to go back to but marlena Cantu is here and she's one of my moderators does when she come on miss jules is she automatically shown a wrench or do i have to add her every time no, if, if you've given her a wrench, it, it's automatically there. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, well, it's interesting. Not that I'm, I, I'm certainly not diagnosing your daughter, but that response that your daughter had is akin to the fifth F, which yes. is fawning. Fawning. Yes. yes. Which is, I tend to be a fawner, which is like, <laughs> can I help? Oh, let me get this. Oh, yes. Oh, uh huh. And of course, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean it's abnormal, but when you take it to an extreme, so fawning in that moment, your daughter, yes, she wanted control, but she also wanted to be kind and put things together. And, but then going down the road, if somebody has a chronic or complex PTSD, and let's say they're a fawner, let's say their, their, their style is to fawn. That's where you get people who become very saccharine. Oh, I love you so much. Everything's great. Oh, you're perfect. I know. And she's perfect. And I'm not perfect. You know, that's the fawning thing. And the reason I, I bring these five things, these five sort of styles, let's call it, of trauma up is because I think if we know what they are and then we can identify some of the behaviors, then it just helps us as people to reflect, say, hmm, I want to, oh, I think I'm fawning here. Well, why am I doing and it? It helps us to self-regulate, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think some of these paradigms, I call them, uh, like the five Fs, let's say, and giving examples, which you can go on my community page to see some examples of the five Fs and what those behaviors might be, helps us to identify, even just for our own journey, what are we doing to try to mitigate feeling uncomfortable in a given moment. So um, do you want to start your little presentation? And if so, I think I need help from my mod my daughter moderator. Um, yeah, I sure. Um, so do, okay. Oh. So, so we want to just kind of follow up. Okay. So, I want to be clear, like I didn't make like a PowerPoint presentation because I knew I was going to be here with Dr. Orta Latina and we would be working together. Um, but just kind of as, as an introduct, like an introduction to the idea, this infographic um, kind of breaks down instead of just being, you know, words, it's showing, it's illustrating how there's different areas of the brain that are, um, in charge of critical survival, right? So with the prefrontal cortex, that, that is where we are uh, making our choices, hopefully good ones. Um, Excuse me for interrupting you. I'm sorry. I just want, sorry. I want to, could you please, for the folks who don't know, show where the front of the head is and the front of the brain and the, and the back. Okay. Uh, so that, where the dolphin is, mm -hmm close to the word amygdala, that's that's this frontal part up here. Back here where it says the cerebellum and it looks kind of green and scratchy, that's this part back here by the brainstem. 
Okay. All right. Now then, so so these areas are are um, they're do they're they're helping us complete really critical behaviors and survival behaviors. Um, paying attention, being able to pay attention, being able to be exposed to inf information and learn something new. And a lot of that, you know, is is very similar to dolphins. For example, you know, dolphins form lifelong friendships. They um, travel in family units. And so it's kind of interesting that that humans are sort of mimicking that. But then we also have the amygdala. And in a minute, I'm going to we're going to Dr. Latina and I are going to talk about which of these systems are most impacted by trauma and which ones are a little bit less impacted. But mm -hmm. the amygdala is basically, you know, the thing that keeps you safe. Um, and it does that by emotions. The emotion, if you think of the word emote, it's a feeling, it's a, it's a chemical reaction that's driving you into action. And, you know, hopefully it's there to keep you safe. If you get scared, you get this intense sensation that may say, you know, go away or faint or fawn or whatever it happens to be. Um, at the, you can also get angry. And, and as long as you learn how to manage anger in a healthy, productive way, rather than giving in to the destruction of a lot of energy, then you can learn, you know, anger can sometimes get you out of a real bind and get you unstuck and moving forward in your life. <laughs> Brainstem is there. It's survival. It's your heartbeat. It's, you know, the the um, basic survival of the body itself without any kind of higher cognition. Um, the fight or flight response can come to some extent there um, in terms of it, you know, increasing your heart, if you're going to fight or flight or what you're going to do. Breath Cerebellum is related to movement. And this is the back of the head. Um, cerebellum is related to movement and uh, coordination. And then your hippocampus is um, memory and learning and developing, developing a, 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 his, a narrative of your history. So those things, um, th those five systems together, different different lobes, different portions of the brain then can be uh, affected by the different traumas that we experience. Now, the way that the brain is responding to trauma, you can go to that next uh, infographic that's got one, two, three, four on it. So the way that, can you hear me? Did I lose you? I'm gone. Okay. All right. So with so the way that the brain is working in terms of, of trauma, it's always working. The, the awareness is there and we're constantly, the brain is automatically without much thought, is sort of scanning for danger. Um, the information in the environment is filtering through the limbic system and it's, it's basically doing an assessment of are we in trouble here? Is everything okay? Are there any predators in this area? And it's and it's actually a cooperative effort between the frontal, the amygdala, and to some extent the um, brainstem. Then, if there is in fact a um, threat that is perceived, then the amygdala goes, "Oh my gosh, we're in trouble!" and it sends out an alarm to the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus responds by releasing stress hormones, and the and the stress hormones then uh, stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, which is where you get your fight, flight, freeze, fawn, or faint. Um, <laughs> This is this is that area that was in action as my daughter was running around picking up the the debris from the car accident. She wasn't really thinking. She wasn't like looking around and going, oh, I think I'll tidy things up. It, it was a survival it, um, instinct and it was all happening outside of her conscious awareness. In fact, it was so far outside of her conscious awareness that she didn't even form a memory of of having done that. Are we on the right um, slide, by the way? I'm sorry. Excuse me for interrupting. Sorry for interrupting you. Uh, does Francesca have the right slide up? 
Oh, I think so. Oh no, go go to the slide that says one, two, three, four, right there. All right, so you might have to go over a little bit of that again because it, it didn't jive with the, with the infogram. Okay, so um, the your brain, if I start back over at one, mm -hmm. the brain is outside of real conscious awareness. The brain is always, there's a filter on and it's constantly scanning the environment to see if there's danger. Mm -hmm. If the, if perceptually you pick up on something that is out of the ordinary, something that shouldn't be there, something that may be loud perhaps, or maybe something that's way too quiet. The idea being there's something here that's not normally here. Are we in trouble? At that point, then you do get this heightened sensory experience. And, and you know, you might think that, um, that uh, uh, what's her name? Dylan. Dylan. No? You might think that that's why Dillison, Dylan heard somebody say someone's here. There might have been a change in the environment that her brain automatically picked up on that she sort of honed in then and tried to zero in. Well, am I hearing anything? Like something feels weird. Why does it feel strange? And not really know what it was that was feeling strange. So, um, so, so it's happening without you doing anything at all. It's, it's naturally there to keep you alive. Now, if the brain does perceive a change in the environment, the brain picks up on something that, hey, that we could be in danger here, then it will, the amygdala is really responsible for that. And it does send out a message to the hypothalamus that says, holy hell, we're in trouble. And so then stress hormones are released. And then the sympathetic nervous system is alerted saying, hey, guys, we're in trouble. Y'all better get ready to run or fight or be extra sweet or whatever you're going to do to try to get us out of trouble. <laughs> Wake up and get ready. And so that fight or flight, freeze, fawn, I missed one. Flop. Flop. <laughs> um, so the five Fs are now, you know, uh, front and center, depending on, on what is about to happen. And I, that is what was happening with my daughter is that she wasn't aware of what she was doing, but her brain was like on autopilot. It was in survival mode. And, and something about that situation was get this back where it's supposed to get it back where it was before this danger, you know, presented itself. Um, if, so, so once the sympathetic nervous system is ignited and, or, or stimulated and the heart rate has gone up, you're breathing, you're, you're, all the blood is rushing to the proper places to prepare you for what you're going to have to do. Then, then the level of fear, frustration, and, and, uh, emotional reactivity to what's happening can either it can either enhance your reaction or it can actually interfere with your decision making. Mm -hmm. So there's a fight or flight response, but then there's also kind of a moment of indecision that can happen as well. So depending on the situation, the brain may not be kind of reactive and on point and efficient like we would hope. It, it might be that you get something like my, my daughter's friend who ended up, she was uh, distraught and couldn't do anything. And she kind of internalized, right, or froze. And so one might think that in that situation, maybe the fear, the, in, the experience that she had, maybe it just resulted in her inability to make a choice on how she should react in the moment. Um, it, it, it be, Dr. Latina hit on this earlier that it becomes very important to understand the impact that prior childhood trauma or even previous um, adult trauma can uh, enhance the brain body response. Um, and so it, it is important if you've had a history of trauma, it is important to recognize that could predispose you to an enhanced level of trauma reaction should you encounter a new trauma? And so, you know, there is treatment out there. There's, there's healing um, if, you, if you know what to look for in terms of, you know, working with someone. Okay, next slide.
Is so the freeze it? response is. Um, Oops, my bad. Simple. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's okay. Uh, so the freeze response, I think, was something that Dr. Latino was going to talk about. Right. The tonic immobility. Yes. All right. Well, I mean, it, you've gone over sort of the brain and where in the brain. In fact, the entire brain is is moving sort of simultaneously. And there are connections amongst the different areas of the brain. But the freeze response really, I mean, in some ways, it re, it's an autonomic nervous system response, meaning that um, and tonic immobility means that you're just kind of you're, you're almost like you're you're flaccid. You can't move. And it's not under it's as you said it's a muscle lockup unmoving and that piece of it physiologically is not under your control mm -hmm. and so and we see a freeze response by the way guys sometimes in a certain type of stage of one's sleep cycle where you are on the verge of awakening and you have something called a hypnopopic hallucination which it, it's literally you're awake, your eyes are open, you can hear, you might even have a hallucination and you, but you're still in a, a part of the REM sleep because in REM sleep, when you dream, you don't do anything. That's why you don't jump off a bridge or go kill somebody or whatever your dreams are about. You you're in a, in REM sleep, you're not able to actually move. It's a, it's your brain's way of protecting yourself so that you can process all kinds of, ideas, things that have happened, but you're, you're really tonically immobile. So that can happen and does happen during a normal sleep cycle. Then as you awaken, you can have something called a hypnopopic hallucination. And during those kind of awakening, you're also frozen so that you can have what feels like you're still in a dream state. So, and this is related to Dylan, by the way. This is how I'm going to try to connect the two. You're in a dream state. You're lying in your bed. You're having a dream, but it's your eyes are open and you're halfway awake. And yet you cannot move because you're still in part of the cycle of REM sleep. So take that physiologic phenomenon and fast forward it, so to speak, to somebody like Dylan who gets up, she hears something, uh -huh opens the door a couple times, then comes into contact or visual contact with the suspect, Brian Koberger. And she is like, whoa. And her body has an involuntary freeze reaction. Now that is a very primitive reaction that we know from primates and even non-mammalians through hundreds of thousands of years have had and continue to have that freeze response in reaction to a perceived threat because it is thought that if you, this is on the more primitive animal level, if you don't move, you will camouflage yourself and therefore you will protect yourself from death. In humans, okay, we still have some of these primitive responses. So in the freeze response, you have the tonic immobility, you're standing there. At that moment, she may not have been able to move. It's a way of her body just saying, I'm, I don't want to die. I'm just going to. Yeah. But the negative part of a freeze response, it worked for her. We don't know why it worked. He didn't either. He didn't see her because she, it was dark or in the dark and she didn't move like this. So he it didn't catch his attention or it, he saw her and made some sort of a volitional decision not to, to hurt her. Right. But the freeze response is in some ways not the most generally, if you're generally speaking, the best um, response in the sense that on the human being level, when you have a freeze response, human beings, think of your predator. If you're, if you're like a roach or I don't know, wherever the freeze response starts in, in the life chain, if, if you're at the lower end of, of animals, those animals don't have all the perceptive abilities, thinking abilities that a human being does. So that freeze response works really well. But in a human being, we still have that primitive response. 
but our perpetrator isn't just looking and seeing nothing. Our perpetrator is intelligent, so to speak, is able to use many different things. They're hearing their looks and they're able to say, Oh, that person is frozen. I'm going to get her or him. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say that the freeze response is not volitional. While it did help Dylan in this instance, it isn't per se on a long-term basis. Mm -hmm. Very, um, I don't know what the word is. When helpful, I don't, there's a better word than helpful. But it isn't something that necessarily is the is the most uh, advanced. It's not an op It's not an optimal response optimal. if you're in danger. Thank you. That's what the word is. Not optimal. It is right. The, we have a, we have more effective ways to survive, but you've got to remember your whole brain is working together. And if if you're in a novel situation, you've never been in that level of danger before your, your brain is going to take over. And that that's actually one of the trainings that's done by um, the military, Navy SEALs, whatnot is when you are terrified, how do you continue to move? How do you continue to go against that instinct for freezing? And, and they do in vivo experiences. They put them in experiences where they're terrified and then they're saying, okay, what's the right optimal choice. And so they, you know, they kind of develop a, a, um, a map on how to move when they're in a dangerous situation. So it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. I do think there are ways, there are absolutely ways that a person can learn to overcome a freeze response or oh, a yes. startle response or that kind of thing. Um, but it does take training. And that's why going to a therapist, a counselor, whatever, to learn some of the methods that can yeah. help a person not do that. Now, and there have been a couple questions that have come up. So I'm going to stop you for one second. Um, Beckfist asked a question. I told her I'd get back to her on that. Crime powwow um, asks about the white coat syndrome come from PTSD? That's a great, great response, a question, because uh, the white coat syndrome is when you go to the doctor, they have the white coat on. And as soon as they go to take your blood pressure, you're, you've got out of control blood pressure. Um, whereas normally you would not have an out of control. You might be, uh, you know, have a normal blood pressure. And yes, I think I had never really thought about the white coat syndrome or white coat effect being a, a, a trauma response. I, I didn't, hadn't put that in my head really, but I do agree with you. It is a form because generally when somebody has a, a out of control blood pressure and I'm in the room, we'll, uh, we'll lay the person down. I will leave the room. We'll turn off the lights. Maybe put some music on and say, let's have you come I'll, I will get my medical assistant, not me, to come back in 10 or 15 minutes is usually what we do. And then we retake it. And if it is a white coat, sort of almost like trauma response, fear response, they'll be in the normal blood pressure range. The one thing I will tell you that we do know about the white coat response is that folks that do get that huge increase in blood pressure even if it's from a trauma response so that they had a problem, they were hospitalized as a child, whatever, folks that get that blood pressure response are people who, if you look down the road, 10 to 15 years will develop hypertension. So they already mm -hmm. have a propensity to getting increased blood pressure. Their trauma response allows them to get that increased blood pressure. But when you get a, a response based on the white coat syndrome that puts you at 210 over 110, things like that, that is a person that has an underlying propensity to develop hardening of the arteries. I hope that helps. Wow. That's it. I didn't know that about the future. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So when people have that happen, generally what we say is, okay. Let's talk a little bit about what makes you so anxious, whatever. But 
let's look at some of your risk factors. Do you have a family history of hypertension? Are you, what, what is your body mass index? What are your lipids like? I mean, so it, it offers us an opportunity to shine light on some of their risk factors going forward. Mm -hmm. There was one more question. May I, I uh, Jules, I know you're in the middle of your presentation. Can I ask you a question? Yes, you may. Someone who is uh, physically conditioned, they're, health, they're healthy. Mm -hmm. Is their blood pressure less reactive to situational changes? Is it, is it more stable or doesn't make any difference? No, it does. Um, generally, it's funny that I just did a blood pressure the other day on somebody and I knew right away, even though the person was upset, blah, 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 whatever, their, their pulse, their heart rate was 50. And I said, boy, I said, you must be in great shape. Do you run? Da, da, da. The person said, no, but I do have a job that requires me to be moving all the time, lifting things, etc." And so their heart rate, their baseline heart rate probably is 40 or something. They're mm -hmm. young and they were very anxious with me, but they did not raise their heart rate. Interesting. So I th th there's no doubt that being in excellent physical condition is, does limit the amount that your heart rate can go up in, in a response to fear. Um, however, I have to say, even in the face of being in excellent shape, having a baseline, almost bradycardic or slow heart rate, folks that have that tendency can still get their blood pressure up. Mm -hmm. Their heart rate may not go up as much as you would yeah. expect. Interesting. Okay. So Beck Fast wanted, asked a while back if the reactions, the trauma reactions that occur, are they based on social experiences versus your DNA? And there, I, th I would answer, you can answer too, but I would say. It's, it's really, can you read that again? I wish we could pull her up. It's Beckfast. I don't know if Francesca can pull it exactly up because I wrote it down. But what this is what I, I maybe she could ask this or he could ask this again. Um, but I'm going to say what this person said, asked was, are trauma responses based on your, and I think what they're saying, let's say you're a flopper or let's say you're a fawner or let's say you're a freezer. Is that based on how you were raised, your social experiences, or is it based on your DNA and your hard wiring? I, do you want me to answer that? First, yes. Uh, okay. I, um, so I, I am a true cognitive uh, behavioral. So I, there is no doubt that I think their trauma response is based on previous social ex experiences. Um, if you take a person, say a child, a person that was put into organized sports when they were a child, that, that provides them certain experiences that another child who may be their, um, maybe their preference is piano lessons, right? Maybe they're really gifted musician. Well, when you're a gifted musician and you're sitting at the keyboard playing, you don't often have a ball coming at your head at 40, 50 miles an hour, right? But if you're, if you're playing baseball or soccer, you probably are going to have those moments where you learn to duck and cover. And, and I think what happens is it develops, conf you develop confidence in your physical body in response to these mm -hmm. moments. Um, as opposed to someone who is very cerebral, spends much of their time, you know, in intellectual pursuits, maybe they're not quite as confident that they can control their body and, you know, move reflexes, be finely tuned and that kind of thing. Um and, it, and I think it's not just operant conditioning. I think there's some classical conditioning in that too, um, that they just begin to have a sense of ownership over feeling inherently knowing how to respond when there's an oncoming threat. What, 